All right, good morning everybody. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn. I'm glad we have a good head count here today. Yes, thank you for your support. Uh, as you know, we do a series of Lunch and Learn, so <clears throat> we're going to advertise about our next show as well uh, later on. But uh, l let's start. Uh, can I ask you if you can hear me well in the back or should I use a microphone? Is that, is that better? Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay, I, I'm going to use that. Okay, let's, uh, let's get starting here. So our talk today is on what's new with multi-stage frac horizontal well. So as you know, uh, one slide about petrol management, uh, these are the services that we offer, and we left you some brochure about what we do. Uh, one of the um, uh, items that I'd like to highlight is the optimization of a multi-stage frac. Uh, we give you a, a, a full complete service from the frac design, performance evaluation, prediction, all of that we offer for the multi-stage frac. And we combine all of these uh, tools from geological data, geomechanical, reservoir engineering to give you a good frac design, optimize uh, the design of the multi-stage frac and give you some predictions on what to expect from your well. Uh, this is our upcoming event. We have another lunch and learn coming in. Uh, so you can put your name down. It's how to get the most out of well testing. So that is October 19th. Just to go through the agenda, what we're going to cover today. Uh, first, I'm going to start with uh, some of the completion issues with the multi-stage frac, including hybrid wells. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the frac geometry, uh, how this will affect the performance of the well, and how we can evaluate complex fracs or random frac geometry. And then we're going to talk about um, uh, sometimes some of the tools like microseismic, how we can utilize it to improve our modeling of your multi-stage frac and of course better prediction and uh, the last item I hope we're not going to run out of time but the last item will be on how to optimize the spacing between the wells now this is the part I'm going to be presenting uh, uh, I'm going to share this presentation with Dennis Godet Dennis uh, so we work together on some uh, frac optimization work and he's going to cover uh, all of this item here so I'm going to leave it to him later on. Uh, also I, I'd like to uh, thank Geologic. We have a team from Geologic here that provided us with a bunch of uh, statistics about the frac, the latest and the greatest, so Dennis will present that. All right, so before we get going, I, I guess I wanted to mention that, uh, boy, summer is disappearing on us and winter is coming, so lots of people thinking of uh, going south, uh, hopefully after the hurricane season. So uh, for the travelers, I have a new technology for you for traveling. Uh, so let me show you here the new technology of air travel. <clears throat> so we still, we still have some tickets available in business class, by the way, if you're interested. All right, let's get serious now and talk about our subject here. So how did it start with the multi-stage frag? Just to get you warmed up here, uh, this fellow here, George Mitchell, is the guy behind all the trouble that we are in. Everything we do now is a multi-stage frag. And thanks to uh, this fellow, uh, George, he, he's the fellow that started the idea. He started to drill wells in the Barnett Shale, uh, initially with vertical wells, uh, with not much success. Two decades after that, finally, he came up with the horizontal well with the multi-stage frag that made our industry so different. That's all we do now, and Dennis is going to show you some of the, the statistics about multi-stage frag. Uh, obviously, with his success, uh, a company like Devon Energy bought him out and uh, sent him a check of three and a half billion dollar. He became one of the richest men. Here's an idea for you guys to get rich fast. Just come up with a new idea like that. All right, so let's talk about hydraulic fracking. Uh, we're not going to get into the basic, you guys know all about fracking, but uh, uh, basically we have advanced so much in fracking our wells. If you visit the site, when we frack a well, you see a massive amount of equipment, uh, huge power to pump at a high pressure to break down the rock. Um, uh, how about water? Well, we use huge amount of water for fracking, maybe 2 million gallons per stage. Uh, propent, uh, you hear about 200 tons per stage, maybe 300 tons per stage now. A huge amount of activities take place in fracking our well, so we're really getting good at it. The one thing that we're lacking a little bit is our effort in terms of 
how we optimize the frag and how to monitor the performance of our multi-stage frag. Uh, we tend to use the cookie cutter approach sometimes. If our neighbors are using 20 tons per stage, we do the same. They must have done their homework. They must know what you're doing. We copy them and everything should be fine. Well, that's not really what we recommend. We always like you to do your own uh, due diligence about how you're gonna design your frag to get the best value for your money. That's uh, the key point here. So let's talk about the completion techniques. You guys are familiar with that, but we're gonna add something new. Uh, there is the open hole completion, the bull drop. There is the plug and turf for case hole, and there is the hybrid well completion. So when we talk about open hole completion, uh, especially Packers Plus, we have somebody here from Packers Plus. Um, you run the liner, and you have a bunch of inflatable packers. We inflate them to provide isolation. And then there's a sliding sleeve in between to frack. So we frack one stage at a time. We activate each stage by dropping this ball that will help open up uh, one stage at a time. So open hole completion is one of the very popular type of completion. It does have advantage and disadvantage like any other technique. But let's talk about some of the advantages that I like. When you frag the well, you have flow along the frag wings, but also you have flow along the well bore. And that is also a very, uh, very good feature of open hole completion, because we take advantage of the metrics flowing into the well bore, especially if you have reasonable permeability, you get good contribution uh, from uh, the metrics. Also, by fracking in an open hole section, um, you have a chance to have branch fracks, you might have initiation point, different points along the open hole section, uh, which will give you a uh, good performance. Um, some of the, I would say, disadvantages sometimes, we have a problem seating the packers, but now they use better packer design, like swill packers that uh, is larger, it can isolate better and better performance. Um, what else? Uh, how about the, the ball that we a pump in the well. If that ball gets stuck in one of those sliding sleeve, uh, we can have a problem. But now they have dissolvable balls, so we have a solution for every uh, every problem. Uh, of course, uh, if you're concerned about stand production or the hole, uh, the formation is not hard and rock quality, uh, then uh, open hole will not be the best. You have to look at maybe a case hole completion. Um, case hole completion uh, also is quite popular. You run the liner, cement it, and basically we work on section. We start with the toe, you perf part of the uh, uh, liner, frack, place a plug, and repeat that process. So the advantage of case hole um, that you can have unlimited number of frack stages. I've seen wells that they have 90 stage or even 100 stage because you, there is no limitation on how many uh, stages that you can introduce. And, uh, the one restriction uh, that you only have flow along the frack wings. You don't have flow along the wheel board itself. Well, w which could be a restriction anyway. Um, uh, also, obviously you conserve the integrity of the wheel board by having a liner in the well, less sand production, and uh, as I mentioned that you can have unlimited number of stages. Now, the, the, the issue of, of the case hole is when you start with the toe, uh, you have to run uh, the perforating gun, and once you perf and frack, you have to place a plug and then mill it out. Now, for very long horizontal well extended reach, to be able to push the gun on a coil tubing, that might be a little bit of a problem. Also, to be able to mill out the plug when you have 2,000, 2,500 meter, that becomes a challenge for coil tubing, and that's why we came up with uh, a new technique, which is the hybrid um, completion, where you combine the two techniques, the open hole close to the toe, and the case hole close to the heel of the well. Um, uh, this case study was published uh, recently. Here is the reference in Argentina, basically in that region. And uh, this particular well uh, had a lateral of about 2,000 meter, and um, about the same in the vertical uh, TVD. Now, uh, obviously, if you don't have the coil tubing that can push your tools, like to mill out a plug or perforating gun uh, 2,000 meter, uh, then we have to find a solution. And the solution uh, that they came up with is the hybrid completion. So uh, basically, uh, 
there are different solutions to be able to reach far into the horizontal well to mill out your plug or run a perforating gun. Uh, uh, these are some of the interesting new technology. Uh, there is what's called dissolvable ball isolation seat. This is not the ball, this is the seat itself. It's made of degradable material that when you place a plug, you don't have to mill it out. It will dissolve by itself. It's like black magic. So let me show you here uh, just a few seconds of that uh, interesting dissol dissolvable seat. At the beginning of the stimulation operation, a degradable ball is pumped down onto the newly formed seat, completing the isolation of the target interval from previously fractured zones. The stimulation fluid is then able to create fractures in the new interval. After stimulation, the ball and lower portion of the seat, both made of elemental degradable technology, dissolve and within days completely disappear. The upper ring component of the seat degrades more slowly to maintain the functional integrity of the seal while the zone is being stimulated. After the ring... All right, so I just wanted to show you that video. Uh, by the way, just to mill out a plug operationally, it will cost you $100,000. So by using this uh, degradable uh, ball seat, uh, you save that kind of money of going inside the hole and milling out and the potential of formation damage and all of that can also occur from that. Uh, but the hybrid complete, uh, or there is also degradable diverter that has been used uh, to isolate the section that you frag. That's another option available. And finally, the hybrid, which is uh, the example that we're going to show you now in Argentina, where uh, the uh, section close to the toe is completed with open hole completion. So you don't have to run uh, for a long distance with the perforating gun or to mill out a plug. Uh, so you perforate the, um, sorry, uh, you complete the well open hole completion with the isolation ball. And the other half of the section, uh, we use case hole completion. So we cement the liner or the casing, perf and plug. So that's an interesting uh, technique has been used. They used uh, 13 stages uh, for the ball isolation section. And then uh, on the case side, uh, they use about 15 stages for plug and perf. Now, uh, we engineers, we like to collect information data to monitor the performance of the well. So we always have this wish list that we go to the boss and say, hey boss, I want to run micro seismic so I can try to understand the frag geometry and how successful we are. Or I want to use maybe a tilt meter, that's another tool to figure out the frag geometry. How about production logging? So I know the contribution from each frag stage. Trace field surveys, these are also very useful tools. Um, after you frag the oil, you flow back the well, and based on the amount of traces, we can tell the contribution from each stage, which is extremely uh, useful. Uh, how about doing some production rate or RTA, rate transit analysis. All of these tools does cost money. So if you approach the boss and boss, I need to have this information. Sometimes you hear nasty comment from the boss. The boss is telling, hey, we're not in the business of scientific challenge. We are here to make money. So he's telling you, don't waste your money on these tools. That's not fair, isn't it? Because we engineers, we like to, to know how good of a job that we are doing and how to improve it. So we like to respond to the boss and explain that we're not wasting money by spending on micro seismic or production logging. We are investing in our reservoirs because when you invest, you get good data, you can improve your frag design and get better performance. That's how you sell to the boss, getting all of this data. It's a real battle, by the way, to get, the, to get data and get the, the manager or the management to spend money on that. So one of the tools that is widely used now in multi-stage frack is microseismic. And that's a typical diagram to show the cloud events from each stage. Each color represents one stage. And you can see from this diagram, we can extract information about the frack geometry. Have we been successful in fracking every single stage? Have we seen a single planar frack or a branch frack or a complex frack? All of this information you cannot obtain without having a tool like micro seismic, yes, it costs money, but the benefit is huge because if you can improve production uh, by 10, 15%, this tool, this uh, expenditure that you spend is well spent. You're gonna get your money back plus profit. Uh, uh, here's a study that was done uh, a while ago. Here's the reference, as you can see there. And uh, uh, this study was done in the Montney 
in that area. Basically, the whole purpose of that study was to compare open hole completion versus case hole. So you can see here, uh, this is the open uh, case hole completion, and you can see the result from the micro seismic, and this is the case hole completion. Now, if you look at the uh, case hole completion, uh, you can see maybe you only have one, two, three, four events. Uh, these bubbles here uh, represent the geometry of each frag. And you can see that the extent of the frag stages is not very large. Uh, if we compare that to the open hole completion, you see more events obvious from the open hole completion and also the extent of the frag wings is pretty extensive. Uh, you might even see a more of a complex frag uh, which will add value uh, to your production. So uh, based on based on the micro seismic also, if we look at the production data from the two techniques, uh, the case hole and the open hole completion, that was uh, concluded by uh, this paper here. I don't want to tell you that you should go for open hole completion always based on the study, but it, it shows the tools that you can utilize to evaluate one technique against the other in your area. And these conclusions could actually vary from one field to the other. But in this particular example, it looks like the open hole uh, completion technique, this is the production, average production from about 11 wells. Uh, as opposed to case hole completion uh, from a production of 19 wells. So based on this comparison, you see the open hole completion seems to outperform the case hole. Look at the initial rate. Uh, this is about seven and a half million, and here is about five. After six months of production, uh, you see definitely uh, better performance from the open hole completion. Also in the same report, uh, it mentioned in addition to the performance, that the open hole completion seems to be faster. It can shave off about three days of stimulation time because of the continuous operation of the pumping in the open hole completion, which is a positive thing. How about the frag geometry? Now, we engineers would like to assume that the frag geometry are all symmetrical. They are all parallel. They all have the same frag half length. Uh, the same conductivity, everything is identical for simplicity. But the reality from the micro seismic is different. We don't have homogeneous reservoir 100%. We always have difference in reservoir quality, the rock mechanic, that will give you totally different frag geometry. Uh, that could happen sometimes that you fail to break down certain stages. So you leave a space that is not frag or maybe the frag stages uh, went in, in a different spot than what you would like. And we're gonna explain how that can happen. So uh, based on what we've seen, uh, nearly 70% of what you produce comes out of 30% of the frag stages because of the frag geometry is so different. Uh, this diagram shows, uh, let's say you have a case hole completion and each cluster here is one stage, another stage in here. And you can see here that as you frack the well, this is the heel, this is the toe, you're pumping in this direction. You'll find that the first cluster of perforation takes most of the fluids. Look at the uh, green bar here compared to the second cluster, and these are the six clusters that we have per stage. So that obviously would create uneven fracture geometry. And of course, to avoid this situation, um, uh, some of the frac company they like use diverters basically to, to divert the fluids from the first stage to benefit the other uh, clusters uh, in one stage. And we're not going to talk about diverters today here, but just to give you some ideas. Um, some other reason why we have um, uneven or random fractures. Now, I'm avoiding to use the word complex fracture because that's coming later on. I'm just gonna use for now random or unsymmetrical fracture. Let's say we have an open hole completion. So here are my packers. We're gonna inflate the packers and frack this well. Here's the frack port. Now we're supposed to have a frack right at that port. But sometimes the reality is from micro sizing, sometimes we see that the frack tends to, to be close to the edge of the packer. And the reason why when you inflate the packers, uh, it applies very high stress in this area of the horizontal well. But once you get away in the open hole section, you have lower stress. And because of that contrast in stress, uh, some of the frag stages tend to uh, place itself by the edge of the uh, packers. Uh, 
Also, uh, because it's an open hole, you might have um, multiple points where the frack is initiated. So you don't have even fracture as you would think or you plan to. How about case hole completion? Here's my liner and it's cemented and you can see that we have a poor cement behind the casing. That means when you fracture well, uh, the fluids might travel behind the casing and then you don't have a successful frack or you have the frack at the different points. Some of the frack, the overlay even. So what's the answer? How do I uh, characterize a complex frack? Well, in the past, we always like to use a symmetrical model. Here are my frack stages, they are spaced equally, they have the same frack half length and uh, basically centered along the horizontal well. But that's in the textbook, we don't have homogeneous reservoir. Whenever you frack your well, you're going to get very odd geometry. So basically we like to be able to monitor, to, not just to monitor, but to model the performance of a well with complex geology. Uh, so basically, we're going to create a model where we can actually model complex frag geometry. So you can see here, uh, this frag is tilted. It's close to this, the first one, so there might be some interference between those two stages, which is not good. Or you might leave a space in between that you're supposed to frag. You see that frag stage is off-center, so really very uneven uh, geometry of the frag. And I guess the question is, can I, can I model this? Because all my models in the past have been always symmetrical frac geometry. And how this really affect my performance? So some of the issues about random frac geometry that uh, you, you might not recover as much as you like from this well because maybe you leave more space in here. Or maybe that um, off-center uh, frac stage might hit the frack next door if you have a parallel well. Uh, so the frack tips might meet, especially if you have water flood uh, that can hurt your water flood in terms of water breakthrough. Or a frack hit by itself can actually damage uh, the well offsetting that. So there are so many negative things about uh, this uneven uh, frack geometry. So if I have micro seismic, I can take my micro seismic data and try to enter it into my model. So let's say you have a cloud event uh, for this particular stage, another cloud event uh, at the stage at the, at the heel. I can take this data from the micro seismic and I can put it into my model and I can model very uneven and random frag geometry. Is that possible? Can we do that? Well, we're going to show you how we do that, but definitely is something we can do now. This is something new that we're going to show you today. Now, some people, they like to know the what's called the stimulated reservoir volume. Is that really my stimulated reservoir volume? We like rectangular. We like really even shapes. Well, my stimulated reservoir volume should follow the, my frag stages, right? As opposed to a very even symmetrical rectangle. So all of that we need to deal with. So what we decided to do is to create a model where we use uh, some of our new features in, uh, we use the uh, Kappa 2 pass software, which is the equivalent to Harmony. And in this software now, there is a new feature where I can change totally the geometry of the fracks based on my micro seismic. I can have tilted fracks, I can have frac off center, I can change the spacing between the frac stages, I can basically model any frac uneven geometry. Now, does it really make a big difference between the performance of a well with symmetrical fracks as opposed to random fracks? And the answer, yes. So to investigate that, we decided to run a model for the, the two cases to show you what difference does it make, uh, whether you consider a symmetrical frac geometry or uneven. So we, we built the model and we used the reservoir pressure of 5,000, the thickness 30 feet, permeability, we're going to run two cases, permeability 0 0.01 and much tighter, let's say in the monthly permeability of 0 0.001. How about the frac stages? I have the same six stages. I have the same frac half length. So we, in our software, we added all the frac half length in here. It's the same exactly 
as the frag half lens in this model. We just change the geometry of the frags. Now, uh, the one tricky part between those two cases is what is the frag conductivity in those two cases? If you have frag lined up at 90 degrees, the fluids will flow straight from the frag wings into your wheel bore. That's not too bad. But if you have a frag with a sharp angle like that, and the fluids are entering at a sharp angle and turning into the horizontal well, you will have what we call frag tortuosity. You have additional pressure drop, a restriction, because of the uneven, the tortuosity of the frags. That creates an extra pressure drop. So obviously for this model, I can't use the same frag conductivity as this model. Now, to figure out this tortuosity pressure drop, uh, we're not going to cover it in this session. We talk about it in another lunch and learn when we talk about mini frag. Uh, in the mini frag process, and then at the end of your mini frag, if you have a step down rates, you can actually from this data come up with the pressure drop. Uh, in, as a result of tortuosity, which will reflect on the conductivity. So basically, I use inference conductivity for this model. I use the restricted conductivity for this model. Now let's look at the production profile from those two cases here. So this is the QM production. If you have random frag geometry, tilted, off-center, all of that, and this is the cube production if you have symmetrical frac geometry. Now, the difference is not huge. It's about, say, 5%. But this is after 90 days of production. If I extrapolate that for a year or two, I might see that the uh, random geometry would give us maybe 10%, 15% less cube production. Now, let me uh, have another case. I'm going to change the permeability for the random versus symmetrical from 0.01 to 0.001 milli Darcy. I'm cutting the permeability by 10 folds. So for lower permeability, you'll find obviously the contribution from the metrics of the world bore is less, and the frag contribution becomes more significant. So let's look at the production forecast for the two scenarios with much lower permeability. So now we're dealing with the permeability 0 0.001. If you look at the random cube production, it's much lower now than the symmetrical. It's about 20% less, and that's in 90 days. That means if I, have, if I extend this forecast for a year or two, you might see that the random fracture geometry will give you maybe 30, 40% less than symmetrical fracture. So the net present value has dropped by 30 to 40%. So is it really worth it that we spend the money on microseismic so we know what sort of frag geometry do we have? I'm sure the answer is yes. We need to really understand that and we can model it for you. So if you have microseismic and you wanted to give us this data, we can enter it into our model and create a model with random uneven frag geometry and give you a realistic production forecast of your well. So this is something relatively new that uh, uh, Kappa has introduced in the software, and I wanted to share it with you. I feel really excited about this because we all use that symmetrical parallel fracs, equal frac half lanes. Now we're getting, getting away from that. Now I can model your complex frac. Now I don't want to use the word complex. I want to use random or uneven because we're going to talk about complex frac geometry soon. Because what we have here is simply a single planar frac, just tilted or off-center. That's what I call a random or uneven frac, not complex. We're going to get into a complex frac geometry soon. Uh, here's a case study from the Horn River, uh, where one of our clients uh, used the pad drilling. They drilled the first well. And in the first well in the middle, which will be, uh, had uh, three stage fracs. Well, uh, they planned to have six, but three stages failed. They couldn't break down the rock. So obviously now we have random frac geometry. You have a big space here without any fracs in it. And we're going to talk also about uh, also the frac geometry. Um, now they went and they drilled the second well. And when they fracked the second well, the frac extended to this well. It hit it. And we can see that from, from the production data. That means this frac 
extended 200 meters. That's a long distance. So obviously, in this situation, we believe there must have been some natural fractures that uh, allowed communication of 200 meters between the two stages. Uh, here's the production profile from the well in the middle. And you can see here that blip in production. This is where the frack hit took place. The well next door, while it was being fracked, the frack fluids hit that well. And that can cause damage to the producing well. So we always recommend that we shut in the offset wells while you're fracking a well, so we don't have a frack hit that can cause a problem. Now let's look at the uh, three wells that we've been talking about. They are some of the first Horn River wells they were drilled north-south. You notice the remaining of the wells are drilled in this direction, and the reason why, we believe that the frack stages will extend in the direction of the maximum stress, which is 90 degrees to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the direction of the maximum stress. So you can see here the frack stages, they will follow this direction, so we have tilted frack stages. The remaining of the wells being drilled in the right direction, the frack stage will extend in the direction of the maximum stress. You get nice transfer fracks. In here you get tilted fracks with less exposure to the reservoir, less productivity. Uh, we did model uh, a transfer frack versus a longitudinal frack just for our interest. And our model indicated that longitudinal fracks will give you 50% less gas if you drill the well in the wrong direction. So it's very important that we choose the right direction of the horizontal well. Now let's talk about micro seismic and also some of the application. This is one of my favorite stories, and maybe I've shared with you that story before, but just to show you the benefit of a micro seismic, one of our clients gave us some test data, a flow and a buildup test. This is the flow period, this is the buildup, and they asked us to analyze the data. We asked them if you have any additional information about, that was a multi-stage frack, about the fracking, like micro seismic or production logging. No, we don't have any data. So we started to model this flow on a build-up test to get the match. So here's our pressure derivative plot. And typically for a horizontal well with a multi-stage frack, your derivative should fall on a straight line with a slope of half. That is linear flow, which is typical of a multi-stage frack. Well, the reality is we did not see that linear flow at all from the pressure derivative, which is an issue because uh, for a multi-stage frack, we expected to see the derivative would fall on that line. Anyway, we tried to match our data and we failed. It was uh, near impossible to be able to match the data, which is unusual. Uh, and the reason why we're kind of disappointed because we've analyzed 20,000 tests in our shop. 20,000 tests in our database. We always have been successful to match the data. So if we failed, there must be a problem. So um, let's see what happened here. Uh, we, we decided, since we failed to match this data with the multi-stage frack, we decided in desperation to match it with the vertical well and see if we can do that. So we used the vertical well model, we got the match. But really, we're using the wrong model. We're using a vertical well model when we have a horizontal well with a multi-stage frack. Anyway, we decided to have a meeting with the client to show them the, the uh, results. And we right away, we mentioned that we have a problem matching your data. There's got to be a problem. And basically, uh, once we mentioned that the well is acting like a vertical well, not a horizontal well, the guy pulled the drawer and got the maps out. He had a, multi, uh, he had a, a micro seismic data, and he showed us the micro seismic data. And the micro seismic data showed the horizontal section with 18 stages, none of them worked. Only two stages, uh, you can see there is an event cloud by the heel of the well. So what happened? Well, apparently there was a fault cutting through the well. And this is a case hole completion. And the cementing was not done properly. So the frack fluids were sneaking behind the casing, activating this fault, and basically uh, overriding each other. None of the other stages were a success. So if we look at the uh, side view also, you see the uh, cloud of the events. It's all happened by the heel of the well. Nothing was done along the horizontal section, indicating that really this well was acting like a vertical well. This is the only the producing section of the horizontal well. So that shows that with the micro seismic, we managed to explain why we had a problem 
uh, with fracking this well, we had the poor cement behind the casing. Without the micro seismic, we would be up in the air. We wouldn't know much about what went wrong with that well. Now, we've talked about uneven geometry or random geometry of the fracks. You have a single planar, but it's not straight, it's off center or tilted. How about complex fracks? So, what you see here is a single planar, a simple frac. You might get into more complex fracks. So, you see here uh, off balance fracks, and this is a very a complex frac where potentially we have intersected lots of natural fractures. So that's what I call a complex frac. How do we recognize that we have a complex frac? Well, of course, we can use some of the diagnostic tools. One of them is the defit mini frac. So in the mini frac, and we expanded on that in our previous uh, launch and learn, uh, this is the fall off data. Uh, when you see the net frac pressure, which is the difference between the ISP and the closure pressure is larger, the larger it is, the more complex frac you have. So that is, uh, has been extracted from the mini frac, and there is a nice paper by Dan from in Canada that explains that. So in this paper, Dan mentioned that the larger the net frac pressure difference, the more complex the frac stages. So from the mini frac, if you run a mini frac in one of your wells, we can tell something about how complex the fracs. How about if you look at the actual G function plot from the mini frac, if you see a hump on the G function above that line, it means you have natural fractures. So you have a complex fracture, and we need to account that when we model your horizontal well. How about if you have a test, like a flow and a buildup test? If you analyze your buildup test, the pressure derivative has a dip like a valley. That dip here is um, a real signature of dual porosity or natural fractures. So we need to account for that when we uh, analyze your multi-stage frac that you have a, a dual process system or a homogeneous reservoir, no natural fractures. Uh, basically from well testing, we extract the value of the omega and the lambda that describes the intensity of your natural fracture. Uh, we run our model with uh, all the cases that we've talked about, this is the random geometry Q production, and this is the symmetrical, which is a little bit better than the, re the random, and this is where we have natural fractures. So in our model, we introduce the value of the omega and the lambda to account for the natural fractures, and you can see we have the best or the highest Q production. If you look at the production rate, this is the dual porosity, you have natural fracture, and this is when you have a homogeneous reservoir, no fracture. So obviously, it is very important that we recognize the presence of natural fracture and utilize it in our modeling. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about here, because I know I'm running out of time and Dennis is getting anxious to show his nice slides, uh, is the well spacing. Uh, this is a case that came from the Barnett Shale. We have two uh, horizontal wells uh, in the Barnett Shale. Uh, and the client was interested to know about the well spacing. Do we have the right spacing between the wells? So we took this data habit analyze uh, using RTA retransitive analysis and build the model. Here's my two wells. Uh, this is a permeability here of 38, 36 nano Darcy. Now we're getting into the nano Darcy level. Uh, this well had uh, 1200 nano Darcy, uh, much better. So we put these two wells in our numerical model and ran it to see if, uh, if that spacing is adequate between the wells or we're leaving a lot of gas in between. And uh, just to show you the uh, result of that, we're going to run the animation of our model to show you how the pressure drop occurs when we put the well on production. Uh, th the first well was an open hole completion. This well went on production six months later. So you see there is a pressure drop along the frac wings, but when we turn around, there is a pressure drop in between, indicating that we have flow along the well bore, uh, which is typical for open hole completion. Now, after a few minutes or seconds, uh, the second well will go on production, which is the case hole completion. And now we're going to see the pressure drop occurring in the offset well as we put on production. So now the, the, the main objective is, are we draining the gas in between? Or the well spacing was large. It was about actually, I think, 400 meter between the two wells, which obviously is quite large. You can see there is no pressure drop in between. 
we're not draining the gas in between. So conclusion, uh, based on our modeling, uh, obviously uh, the wheel spacing between those two wells was quite generous, 400 meter. We recommended to bring it down to 200 meter because you can see there is no pressure drop in between. We're not draining the gas in between. Conclusion, um, there is always new ideas in our multi-stage frack. We've talked about some of the new ideas like the hy hybrid completion, how to model uh, uneven fractures, how to use the micro seismic for that. Uh, we also talked about the numerical modeling to help us uh, recognize or optimize uh, the spacing between the wells. So that will take us to the end of my section and I'll let Dennis continue his part. Sorry, I took a bit more time, but let me get your presentation here. Okay. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about some actual frag, frag data. And just a very, very quick slide on radial flow. Radial flow is uh, a vertical well, radi radial flow. We end up with high pressure drop near the well bore and to frack the well, we increase uh, the capability of flowing faster to the well bore by changing it to a bilinear flow path. So that's really the premise of fracturing. Uh, in fracturing, we go in low pressure reservoirs, low permeability reservoirs, and fracturing very tight shales. Here's a very quick slide on radius of the well bore versus the effective radius. So essentially, when we create fractures, we increase the effective well bore radius and give us a flow path or a highway to the well bore. When we do that, we get increased production of wells, especially wells that are very, very low permeability, as Sad has already talked about. 0 0.001 millidarcy, we start to see very, very increased production with number of stages and number of fracks within the wells. Here's a quick history on frac fluids. Frac fluids early on were naphtha, then went to gelled oils, linear gelled waters, uh, cross-link waters, foam fluids, advanced breaker technology, reduced polymer loadings. In the last five or 15 years, we're going predominantly to slick waters, especially in very tight uh, permeability formations. We need to make sure that the fluids are compatible with the rock, with the reservoir fluid, and we need lower friction pressures, and they need to be environment friendly. So those are some of the things that we're looking for in the fracture fluids. Formation damage is really an item that over the last 30, 35 years has changed dramatically. We look at regained permeability. Guar gums were very, very prevalent in the 70s and 80s. Then we went to better gels where we get um, re regained permeabilities of 50, 60 percent. Slick water, we're finding that with no chemicals, we get much better retained permeability factors. In other words, when we frack with these fluids, the viscoelastic or um, slick waters end up with very, very regain or very little damage. We get good regain permeability. So fracturing successes or refracturing is now becoming more and more, especially in the lower 48. Something like 35% of fracturing treatments now are refracturing wells. Um, the original propent may act as diverting. So usually we start to look at refracturing wells when we look at the production that's reduced and then we turn around and do refracturing work. Here's a typical example of refracturing where we'll have an original decline curve and then refracture and we'll find some new permeability or some new production within the reservoir. So let's look at some of the statistics from Geologic. Geologic, of course, here has a very good database on fracturing uh, technology and fluids. So what's happened in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin over the last five or six years? Well, in the last five or six years, we've seen a dramatic drop in drilling activities. Drilling activities at the end of 2014, you can see that the number of wells drilled dropped significantly 2015-16. And now we also see that there's a significant change in whether the wells are horizontal or vertical. You can see here as a percentage, the horizontal wells to the vertical wells is roughly about 60% horizontal. Now, 
it's probably 80, 85 percent horizontal to vertical. And this is just a map of Western Canada showing where all these wells have occurred in the last six years. Number of wells fractured, according to the database, there's something like over 23,000 wells, uh, horizontal wells, that have been fractured in the last five or six years. Uh, you can see also the uh, same with the drilling activities with a significant drop in 2015 we see the same trend in terms of the number of wells fracked in the last three years compared to the previous three years. So looking at the most active formations within Western, the WCB, the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, we're, we looked at, or we asked uh, Mark, and Mark is here, so if there's any questions on the database, uh, he'll be able to help me. Um, the Montany, the Cardium, the Shonovan, the Viking, and the Bakken are the, probably the most active five formations in Western Canada. And it's color-coded here with the light blue is the Bakken, and I think the dark blue of here is the Montany. So then we asked uh, them to look at, can we split out the technology or the amount or the wells drilled and whether they're cased or open-holed completions? And they were able to do that, and so there's multiple plug and perf, coil tubing cut, coil tubing straddle, and ball and seat. What's really interesting with this graph here is that the ball and seat is seeming to lose its favor over the last couple of years. It's going more and more towards the coil tubing ported packer systems. So as a percentage, we're seeing fewer ball seats completions, and more and more cased completions. And these are all the uh, fractured wells using a different kind of fluids. What's really interesting with this data is the type of fluid that's used in fracturing today in Western Sedimentary Basin is becoming predominantly water and slick water. You can see here as a percentage, we've got slick water and water, and here, the last couple of years, it's probably 95% water compared to a few years ago when it was probably 20, 25% non-water-based fluids. Uh, the amount of energized fluids is also going down. By adding nitrogen and CO2, the amount of energized fluids is also reducing. So this is the length of the horizontal, or the length of the completed. So we've got the length of the completed. You can see there is a trend of it going longer, laterals. And we also see an increasing number of stages. So this is the number of stages. Therefore, the distance between the frac stages is also going down. The fracs are getting closer and closer together. So those are interesting uh, statistics. When we look quickly at the amount of propent or the type of propent used, typically I would have thought that resin-coated propents were used the most, but over the last few years it's becoming predominantly sand. The ceramics have lost their favor, and I think that's because the depth of these reservoirs that we're looking at is not overly large, so therefore sand is becoming as good as a propent as can be expected. So we're looking at the sand propent placed. You can see it's a much bigger pie of the amount of propent used. Let's look specifically at the Montany. The Montany here is broken down into the technology that's used and the fluid that's used. And you see the same trend as the overall number of wells. The type of fluid used in the last two to three years is pretty much water and slick water, which is this number here, the blue and the light blue. And then we also see that the ball and seat is losing a bit of favor. Some of the other plug and perfs as a percentage are staying a little bit higher. So that's specifically for the Montney. Then we also look at the completed length. Again, we see the trend of the length of the completion going up. 
This line here is the average fluid per meter is significantly going up, and the average propent per meter is also on a trend upwards. So we're using more fracks, more fluid, and more stages. With that, even though their completed lengths are going up, we're seeing that the distance between the spacing is less. So the number of stages is going up, and the distance between the stages is going down. So more stages in the horizontal laterals. Um, did that change? Yes. Okay. So the number of fluids, so we're looking at propent and fluid normalization by stage, we're seeing that there's a trend of the amount of fluid going up and the average propent per stage also trending upwards. So again, more stages, more frac or more propent and more fluid. We also asked Mark if they can give us a bit of an idea on the cost. So looking at the cost of these wells over the last few years, the average drilling cost in the light blue here has been steadily going up but now has been coming down. The average completion cost, significant, going not as fast as the drilling cost, but if you look at the last two and a half, three years, the cost is coming down quite significantly. So that's probably because the activity levels are lower and there's less uh, work going around from the service company, so therefore overall the costs are coming down. But there's also, we're putting in more fracks, more fluid, and more activity. Um, I think that's about all I can show here. So now let's look at the Duvernay. The Duvernay, the trends are pretty similar to the Montney. You're looking at the amount of fluid or the type of technology. You see plug-in perfs are, are significantly higher. Fluid usage has gone up and then now the fluid is switching to um, the hybrids, which is a combination of slick water pad and then some viscosified fluid to carry the propent. But ultimately, more and more we're seeing that water is becoming the fluid that's used in these reservoirs. The same trend on the average fluid per meter going up and the average propent per meter also going up. And you can see the completed length is also on the trend upwards, reaching 2,500 meters in lateral length. The stages and the frac spacing, also the same trend, where the average stages are going up. So in this example, it's about 12 or 15 going up to something like 40 stages per well. And the length of these laterals is getting close to 2,500 meters. Um, the propent and fluid normalization. Again, you see the slight trend and increase in the propent per stage. So more propent used in each of the stages. The amount of fluid somewhat going down, but we're using uh, higher, higher viscosity, slightly higher viscosity fluids, but more propent overall. And the drilling costs, drilling costs relatively constant going down in the last few years, and the, com and the completion costs are also going down. If you look at the Montney and the Duvernay comparisons, propent per meter, What's interesting with this is both trends are upwards and then of course the Montagny is using somewhat less than the Duvernay. Duvernays tend to be bigger fracks. Fluid per meter, when you use more propent you need more fluid. Propent per stage, you can see in the Duvernay and the propent per stage is on the both are on an upward trend. The Duvernay is higher than the Montney. Um, and the number of stages is averaging well over 30 in the last year or two. Um, fluid per stage, bigger fracks, more fluids. 
Cardium, a cardium is interesting in the sense that the ball and seed has significantly lost its favor, is going more to the, the pinpoint uh, pr fracking. And what's also interesting also is the fluid is predominantly water and uh, slick water. You can see that oil was used in the 2012 era, reduced quite significantly in 2013. In the last few years, it's virtually only water. Uh, the length of the fracks, again, the completed length is going up, same trend as the other two formations. The average or fluid per meter is going up, bigger fracks because the average, um, the average prop in per meter is also an upward trend. And also the stages, number of stages is going down, or sorry, the number of stages going up and therefore the distance between the stages is, is decreasing or the more and more fracks placed in the same lateral uh, as per other wells. Same trend here, the average fluid per stage somewhat going up, but what's really interesting is the average number of stages going up significantly. So number of stages going from 15 or 16 up to 30. So in most cases we're seeing that the number of stages is essentially almost double to what it was about five or six years ago. Drilling costs coming down, same kind of trend. The average drilling cost is coming down, the completion costs coming down. What we need to make a note here is that in the database not all wells have the information posted as to the cost of the drilling and completions. So the data set on the number of wells for the completion is a smaller set. So therefore, is it realistic? We think it's relatively good, but it's maybe not as good as some of the data, other data. So let's look quickly at NCS. What are the real questions? How do we create reservoir stimulated volume, how do we get reduced capital cost, what is optimization, and SAD talked a bit about optimizing the distance and where we put the fracks within the reservoir. Well this would be an ideal fracture network. There's a number of papers relatively new that are talking about what is the fracturing, what is the optimization, what do the fractures look like? So if you're interested, you can start to look at all of these papers and see all the different work, and most of these are done in the States. Optimization, this is what we used to think, and now we're seeing with the increased huge number of stages, huge number of fracks, larger fracks, we're seeing much more closely tight fractures, and that's where we need to get uh, the model to uh, simulate that. And Sad just told me I have five minutes, so we're going to speed things up. So what is pinpoint fracturing? Pinpoint fracturing is trying to direct where the fractures go. We like to see, we'd like to think pinpoint looks like this, traditional completions looking like this. And remember, uh, Sad talked about the geometric and the complex fracturing in terms of the directions of the fractures and all that. We like to think it's like this but it's much more like this in the Kappa model that Sad was showing before. So we're seeing more and more increase in casing installed sliding sleeves, fracture using coil tubing, and then here are some of the bottom hole uh, recorders are available on this equipment. Sad touched on, touched on complicated fracturing. What does that mean? Well. With microseismic, we're starting to see lots of directions and lots of fracturing going on in the reservoir, not planar, somewhere that is all over the place, many uh, micro fractures within the well bore, and as we create these huge fracts with large fracture volumes and huge volumes and rate, we're starting to see much more what we think of complex fractures. So SRV, stimulated reservoir volume, and a number of the papers keep talking about how do we get 
stimulated reservoir volume. And now we're starting to see that we need to get that to get those f multiple fractures, those complicated fractures to produce properly. So then we came up with zipper fracs and modified zipper fracs and modified multi-cycle sleeves. So if you frack here, one and three, and then go in between, and this frack will start to become much more complicated, and we see that on microseismic. So we're seeing more and more of the fracturing along the well bore, not necessarily stage by stage, but starting to alternate where they're fracking. And some of these have been started relatively new. And then we talk about fracture interfaces versus multi-cycle sleeves, looking at modeling these. And here's the NCS cardium market share. You can see that their market share pinpoint fracking is going up, which is sort of partly indicative of the geologic data that was showing ball and seats are losing ground to the multi-cycle to these other types of seals or the other types of fracturing. So in summary, slick water has become the predominant fluids in fracturing in ver very low permeability reservoirs. We're using larger amounts of propants. We're using larger number of stages, increased number of fracs within those well bores, longer completions, Pinpoint fracks are becoming much more common and used, and overall we're increasing the stimulated reservoir volume. So there's that five minutes.